So a while ago I made a video that did pretty well by the standards of my channel and got some mm, interesting attention. Now that I've had a chance to actually play Victoria 3, I want to revisit some of my claims and expectations for the game, particularly in how it portrays progress, westernization, and representations of the non-western historical experience. For the unfamiliar, the Paradox community used to use the phrase ROTW, rest of the world, when referring to nations outside Europe. This predominantly happened in the Europa Universalis games for reasons that might be a bit obvious from the title of that series, but it nominally extended to Victoria 2 as well. A bit of a feedback loop developed here where from a gameplay perspective the rest of the world was underdeveloped, so it got less player attention, and because people didn't play it much it got less development, and so on and so forth. I don't have the full history at hand, scattered as it was across a decade or more of forum posts, but a turning point for this was with the Divine Wind expansion for EU3. I also get the sense that the cycle was further broken when people who had a genuine enthusiasm for history outside Europe started making mods that corrected demographic issues, even adding things like serfdom. Stuff like that is core to the improvements added by popular Victoria 2 mods. People seem to enjoy more accurate models of history, given that every time I said I played Vanilla Vic 2, I got vomit emoji replies. Real quick, I want to say here that this isn't a discussion where I'll be giving much attention to the argument about market ability in different regions of the world, and you might call it naive, but I genuinely don't think Paradox drops DLC about China just to get the China market, or that European players have zero interest in history of places they're not directly from. That discussion tends to subsume entire comment sections when it starts. In the last Victoria video, we explored the idea of Eurocentrism and how games and general depictions of history might efficiently use or distance from a Eurocentric lens. Now, as for why Victoria and general historical depictions might want to step away from a Eurocentric lens at all, well, there's the other video, or the short version, which is that it's a matter of intent. Victoria isn't a game where one plays as a European nation. The options aren't so limited as that. Gone are the days of Crusader Kings 1 where only Christians were an option. The whole of centralized nations are playable. Mentioning CK1 and the unplayable populations might have you raising a finger to go, but what about CK2 and the DLC? And we'll get to that in time. Given the nature of Victoria 3, we ought to understand it is a game of world history, despite the name, and a Eurocentric lens would mark a failure to depict world history. So here I am today to ask the question, did Paradox distance from it? Does Victoria 3 emphasize a broader world? Was I wrong about Victoria 3 when I said it might recenter the genre? Well, to start, I want to address a critique I got more than once on the last video. I anticipated comments saying, of course the game is Eurocentric, it's called Victoria and it's about a time Europe ruled the world. In fact, I anticipated it so much that I addressed it in the last video. A game being Eurocentric when it's called Europa Universalis, or Victoria 2, isn't especially bad because it conforms to the lens it provides. Okay, that's a bit cheeky. Addressing the comments more earnestly and having played the game, I'd say that Victoria 3 has no problem letting European hegemony take its historical course. That's not the concern with respect to a Eurocentric lens. In fact, last time I specified that Eurocentric lenses aren't inherently bad, that they can be useful for understanding the perspective of those in power at the time, or as I put it back then, as a history of hegemonies. One could, in theory, just as well construct a Sinocentric lens for telling the history of Japan or Vietnam using Chinese sources and framing history as a reaction to the actions of China. Scholars even used to do that, and it's why the nature of the Chinese tributary system, which you might kind of know from Mandate of Heaven for EU4, was misunderstood by Western scholars for quite a while. In turn, it would be fair to argue that applying the Sinocentric lens leaves some blind spots and shortcomings. For those familiar with other Paradox titles who are unconvinced of the value of a broader lens, look no further than Imperator Rome. Quite possibly the biggest flaw of that game, at least after the 2.0 update, was that the countries outside the biggest players were fairly indistinct gameplay-wise and ended up as Diet Rome. The extent of flavor for that game that didn't require a dedicated expansion was like, the Celts can research soap. And one could say, well duh, it's Imperator Rome, but the developers decided to include India on the map, and then handed it, and everyone else, the tech tree of Rome, which meant from start to finish, even as far away as Burma, one was researching things like Roman slave branding, 
In turn, as far as gameplay is concerned, Imperator landed in a place where you play one run, you've played them all, and that has a few knock-on effects as far as the community is concerned, but that could be its own tangent, so instead, let's get back to Victoria. The broader claim at stake in the prior video was one about more accurately modeling history, and generally, I'd say this was well accomplished. Let's look at the starting map, and you can point at some things you notice that are different from Victoria 2's map. The biggest ones to me are the changes to Africa, of course, the inclusion of sub-states in the UK colonies like Australia and Canada, and uncolonized land generally having occupants on the map and notably the presence of uncolonized land in South America. Ah, but that's an interesting way to frame it, calling the spaces uncolonized, as in yet to be. In doing so, we refer to these spaces by their relation to Europe as uncolonized land. So when the game offers the term decentralized nations, that's an example of a changed lens. And it's one I'd argue is a very small step to take to be more accurate to history. Funnily enough, some of these changes almost mirror the changes brought on in popular Victoria 2 mods, which is, I guess, the most backdoor way to corroborate their historicity. An adjacent issue to this I want to address for just a second is the distribution of flavor, so to speak. As it stands, the vast majority of unique decision buttons to click and depth are going to be handed to nations that are most likely to be players in the drama to come that is 1836 to 1936. And by nature of the era, that's generally going to be Western powers. To be explicitly clear, I think that's fine, so long as we're mindful of that cyclical trap that got us ROTW in the first place. But that's a problem for Paradox to tackle, and it ties to a bigger one. One difficulty Paradox has here, and indeed has had in the past, is with taking on a broad lens, where at times there simply isn't much information available. Crusader Kings is another good example of this. The start date rulers for CK2 and 3 are not all known, not even in Europe where we have the most surviving records. But instead of just putting like a mystery shadow person, the developers attempted to fill in what they could, sometimes stuff like knowing a particular family was in power but nothing about the person who held the senior title of the realm. The game isn't perfectly true to history, but it's more because of what historians lack knowledge on, more on the limits of historical record, than developer oversight. Is it dubious to just make up placeholders? Maybe, if the intent of the game was to teach people. And that line might set off an alarm bell for some, given how the whole point of this video is the historicity of a game. If a game intends to be a game, it doesn't have to be perfect in terms of detail, and it gets a pass there. But if a piece of media intends to portray world history, then it has accepted the responsibility of being scrutinized from that angle. Imagine if Victoria 3 started with the wrong US president in power, something we knew was untrue. Why is that all that different from Africa lacking formal states outside of North Africa, Sokoto, Zulu, and Ethiopia? At times, the question genuinely is if we know enough to justify an inclusion in the game, and at times, the question transforms to the inevitability of a Eurocentric telling of history that we lack historical records for a place aside from by its would-be Western conquerors. There's an idea put forward by the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard known as a different, which is simply that we have incommensurable moments in language, times where we get stuck in a double bind with respect to trying to communicate an idea. In tellings of history, this manifests in the absence of idealized records, for an example, we can look to the history of Native American and European contact. We don't exactly have both sides. We have stories of the exploration of the New World and an absence of record on the other side that only really gets filled in by very distant recountings. Stories of stories. The Native American perspective, where we have it at all, is often written 300 years later in the language of the conquerors. Can we say we know the true story of the conquest of the Americas through either of those tellings, or would we need record that, by necessity of circumstance, the conquest themselves cannot exist? There cannot be undisturbed tellings of the conquest from a native perspective because the conquests were disruptive. In turn, there are histories we cannot do justice to, cannot know for certain. There are histories for which no tellings and no artifacts remain, and that will disproportionately impact the rest of the world. But that doesn't mean the people in those places weren't real, weren't organized into societies, that they somehow aren't worth putting on the map. And as for why this discussion will probably keep cropping up forever in gamer TM spaces, well...
The video game idea of immersion is incredibly loose and subjective, and so some people see historical possibilities as too far gone to them. Or they simply do not know enough history to understand how close something was to happening. And this can go in either direction. China turning into a Protestant Christian empire due to a mass rebellion sounds like Crusader King's hijinks. But that nearly happened in real history. And if one doesn't know about that event, the two ways to take it are as a neat new immersive alt history possibility in the Vicky sandbox, or as some unrealistic, beyond possibility immersion breaking thing. And I imagine more people would lean to the latter if they lacked the context of actual history. Now, I'm not about to say that there's some little known mass industrialization that went on in the pre colonized region that now makes up Nigeria, but that's not the actual core issue. Some comments I received in the previous video were specifically targeted at the existence of decentralized nations in Africa, stating they would slow down the game at best, or that, quote, Africans were in the Stone Age and map representation is meaningless at worst. Perhaps it's too generous of me to presume this, but I think on some level this stems from people understanding the colonization of Africa as Africa was 100% tribal villages, Berlin Conference divides up the land, Africa insta-colonized. And it really wasn't that simple. It wasn't as simple as Victoria II makes it. Far from the conference, there was tension and conflict. Africa had states that were no more informal than those along the Rhine. I don't exactly trust people who haven't done any reading on the era to make a judgement call on if a people was centralized enough to make it into the game. But I also can't exactly empathize with someone who finds historical accuracy immersion breaking that seeing Africa populate the map is their too far gone moment. Is it bad for Victoria to pivot away from being the scramble for Africa simulator? All this to say, I'm not strictly calling anyone out if their too far gone is my acceptable. I don't think it's inflammatory to be a bit incredulous at the idea of a Sokoto rapid modernization in order to push away colonization, to do what Ethiopia did. I just think it's an interesting gameplay possibility. There's a whole world of history out there to be learned, and limiting oneself to the Eurocentric lens exclusively means missing a lot of angles and places. And so we come to the thing I tabled earlier about CK2 and DLC that opened up parts of the rest of the world to gameplay. There is always the possibility that Victoria 3 will further flesh out regions of the world in updates and DLC. In fact, it's par for the course. In the last video I mentioned I thought it was fine the decentralized nations were unplayable, and while for some people this transformed into thinking I wanted Wakanda gameplay, others were right to point out the stated plan to make them playable in the future. I don't want to get too deep into exacting mechanics that are subject to change, and would rather talk about the broad lens the game has, something that won't change. For that reason, discussing something like a hypothetical Southeast Asian flavor pack that livens up the region, while certainly enhancing the historical depth of the game, isn't as interesting to me as the core elements of the game. That said, the stated intent with decentralized nations and playability is that they are radically different from the centralized nation gameplay, and I wholeheartedly applaud that idea. Paradox games have gradually recognized that one size doesn't fit all in terms of gameplay and portrayals of societies. And I'm not just talking about small flavor things like Celtic soap. I mean horse lords having their own gameplay style, EU4 natives not just being the same as Europeans mechanically, but with a slower research or something. And now, with oncoming decentralized nations. I was content with the idea of them being unplayable because the player is functionally the state in these games, and as such, it's a bit of a challenge to imagine playing nations who are defined as decentralized by their lack of a state. The world history approach means accepting there isn't one societal inevitability, that history isn't the story of westernization. And that's something Victoria 3 does in a subtle way, by having the barriers to industrialized societies be ones of traditionalism, serfdom, issues found in Europe as well, things that caused significant tension in places like Russia. Russia's struggle is better represented now, and not as simple to get rid of as clergy spamming. And it's better represented in a way that also suits Austria, and also suits the once called rest of the world. The struggle of traditionalism versus modernism. In the end, there's a question I don't have an answer for though, and that's, did the world IRL actually westernize? 
And by that, I mean to ask if embracing things like factories and banking and analytic philosophy, symbols of progress, so to speak, can be divorced from being a Western model. There's a whole different conversation one could have about what progress even looks like, how inherent it is, what the point of it is, and if there even is a universal narrative of history. That said, I don't know if Victoria is all that interested in exploring that conversation, for now at least, and if it did, there's likely to be people who would see it as immersion breaking. If China could find its own path and like develop infantry tactics that utterly circumvent the traditional path of line infantry into skirmish infantry into trench warfare, developing tactics that upended what we know about warfare as they once did in the Tang era, well, at what point does that go from alt history to pure fiction? That distinction is the same deal as the immersion line, and it's an unanswerable one in alt history while also having some things we can very easily cross off the list. If countries could build giant steampunk mechs like that Will Smith movie or Elder Scrolls lore, there would be universal agreement that that's too far gone. The real what if in this era is going to include models like Japan, like Ethiopia. What if a historically conquested people successfully resisted? What if a non-Western country became a recognized great power? And it does so in a way where those questions don't stand out when compared to what if Bavaria was the one that unified Germany, or what if Switzerland abandoned neutrality and became a neo-feudal Calvinist crusader state? You know what, maybe that one's too far. In the end, this means the question isn't one of strict historicity, so much as finding the way to model a country's circumstances, creating a world where having real-world conditions doesn't break the expected narrative. It's things like creating mechanics where one doesn't have to put Korea's literacy rate artificially at 3 or 6% in order to make the West and Japan comparatively stronger, as in Victoria too. Or for another example we've seen Paradox change before, it's things like how in true vanilla, yellow Prussia era, there was uncolonized land in South America. But by AHD, they changed it, because the mechanics of colonization meant Argentina and Chile virtually never reached the territorial extent we recognize today. The map was more accurate until mechanics got in the way. Better frameworks mean creating a system that real history can play out in, but isn't forced to. And the fewer magic tricks, the better. Does Victoria 3 accomplish any of these things? Yes. Does it have a lens and some biases? Also yes, but that's unavoidable. I've talked before about how Victoria 2 is a game driven by material goods and thus has a materialist historical perspective. Victoria 3 continues that trend, and in doing so, the game has to model societal wealth and contentedness on things like GDP and standards of living. Some of these ideas are a bit anachronistic, but I think it's an excellent way to develop a framework that takes a relatively neutral stance on individual histories of nations. Material conditions are something we have not just narrative records of, but archaeological records of. And that's why things like materialist analysis consider themselves to be more science than social science, if you follow. And in part, I think that answers one of the starting questions. Is Victoria 3 poised to recenter the genre? Introducing a materialist approach to history, where what holds the country back and keeps things like production and living standards down is archaic despotism, as with the existence of serfdom, that's pretty refreshing. The importance of interest groups and their power base for holding you back is far more accurate and universal a system than Victoria 2's IDK just beat up some nearby guys until you get the hang of being Western. It means no longer having to rack up intangible Westernization points that stand for bucking traditionalism, learning to wear epaulets, and it means that one modern economy faces another equally, where in EU4, there's a bit of a back and forth to be had over the way unit types are locked in and have relative strengths that ignore how much a country modernizes. A consequence of this is that Russia has a struggle to go through that isn't singularly represented by a literacy rate in the past game. The new mechanics put weight on the power of nobility to hold on to power at the expense of progress, to grip tradition with an iron fist as a means of staying relevant. Austria is not faced with a few bad flare-ups of nationalist and irredentist movements, but with the question of disenfranchisement, and is held back by similar forces that held China back from modernizing, the same forces that wanted to retain serfdom, to retain whatever gave themselves power at the expense of others. And in the end, we are still left with that difficult question, the distinction between modernizing and westernizing, which I still can't quite answer. 
In terms of framing, the struggle of tradition versus modernity highlights the similarities between Western autocracies with the rest of the world. It helps portray the concept of backwardness as not uniquely endemic to the Orient. The game has a new approach to history. It changes what makes things inevitable, what nations derive their power from. It introduces some of the interesting parts of Victoria too in a more palatable and comprehensible way, and it shows we can find better and selective uses of terms and concepts like Eurocentrism and Westernization while not throwing them out. If you're new here, hi. I've got another Victoria 3 video coming that's going to be a bit of a soft reboot of a series of videos I started when I had less of an idea how to YouTube. The idea of that series is to explore how we tackle questions of history, historicity, and academic challenges while also looking at how games present history. So maybe subscribe if you want to stay tuned for that. By now, I might also have a live stream VOD up where I just talk about the game in a more generalized review kind of way. I might edit it down into a video that isn't super long and just has my core thoughts, so maybe wait for that if that sounds more palatable than watching a whole disorganized stream. And if you're old here, uh, welcome back. Thanks for watching again. And finally, thanks to my patrons who make these things a bit more possible. I wouldn't have the uh, luxury of the burden of playing 100 hours of Victoria 3 in two weeks to prepare for this video if I didn't have some way of earning off-platform. I recently got a scam tier sponsorship offer for a mobile game that wanted five minutes of gameplay footage in two videos and a hammed up endorsement, and I could never do that to you all, or myself. That's all for now.